As an artist, when it comes time to create, you have two fundamental choices. You can do what you've done before because it worked, or you can try something new. But doing something new doesn't always work out. However, it's not like you need to reinvent the wheel every time you make something. When you change even a simple aspect of your creative process, you might find yourself somewhere you never expected, and the results can be, at the very least, interesting. Howdy doody buckaroonies, this is a cheap viola from Amazon. It cost around $140, it came with a tuner and a bow and some other stuff, and it's even got a case with a little flappy thing on it, and I don't know how to play it. And that is exactly why I bought it. Yeah. I often find myself really envious of my sound design colleagues and friends who work more in the film and game aspect of the industry because the way that they approach the same tools I myself have approached a million times is completely different, and the way that they think about the same things I do is almost completely opposite of the way I look at them. And that to me is incredibly inspiring to know how much there is out there that I don't know and also how much they don't know. That means there's so much room left in between those two points to discover. So as a sort of creative exercise and in an attempt to bottle up that spirit of adventure and exploration, I thought it would be a fun challenge to do something I've done a million times, like create a sample library, but do it with an instrument I have no idea how to play. Of course, it'd be easy to look up some tutorials on the viola, how to play it, how to hold it, how to bow it properly, and all that kind of stuff, but for the sake of this experiment, I purposefully avoided this, because this way I can approach things on my own time and on my own terms and just explore and experiment and enjoy the process of creating at face value and embrace the failures and happy accidents along the way. As someone who's entirely self-taught, I've always been the type of person who's pretty good at picking up a new instrument and figuring it out relatively quickly. This isn't to say that I've mastered everything I've touched, but I can get from A to B in a pretty reasonable amount of time. So, as someone who's been playing a variety of different instruments for the better part of 20 years now, I have some basic background knowledge and assumptions about how this is going to work, so it's not like I'm flying totally blind here. The broader purpose of this experiment, I guess, is to approach something conventional, like a viola, but do it in a less conventional way to get a different end result than what I'm used to when I think of what a viola is and what it sounds like. So the objective of this experiment is to play around with the viola and learn through failure and see what kinds of interesting sounds and textures I can pull from it, and then ultimately try and challenge myself to get creative and turn the happy accidents into something that is ultimately a musical and usable end result. So with that, we have two basic operating principles to produce sound here. We have plucking, and we have bowing. But there are a lot of variations of these two things, and that's what we're going to be exploring with this whole experiment. Much like a guitar, we could pluck closer to the bridge, get kind of a hollow, bright, brittle sound, or up higher on the neck, get more of a dark, rounded tone, and same with the bow. There's a lot of different things. We could play regular old bowing just right down the middle. We could change the pressure or speed of the bow. We could bow really lightly down by the bridge. We could bow really high on the neck. We could, uh, I don't know, like play a note and bow behind it. That's kind of interesting, or we could flip the whole daggum contraption upside down and play like a really soft sort of weird harmonic thing, because there are no rules. This is science. So with that, the thing I've learned in the last couple days playing around with this that is going to be a bit of a challenge is that I have really big hands. and. You know what they say about big hands. It means I have an absolutely enormous amount of work ahead of me if I'm going to make this sound any good.
Who boy, bright and early, it is sampling day, and I love sampling day. Back there behind me, I've got the setup for this session, and it should be pretty straightforward. Normally, when you sample strings and stuff, you are trying to capture the sound of a player playing in a nice hall or chamber or whatnot, and I don't have that. So I figured in the interest of breaking the rules and experimenting a bit, I would try and do something a bit more intimate, sort of inspired by the Spitfire Labs or Frozen Strings libraries, but different. So up there behind me, I've got the setup, and what I landed on for this session after experimenting over the last week or so with different recording techniques is to use a pair of Lewitt 040 small diaphragm match condensers in an XY position and do it about four to eight inches away from the viola. Normally this is sort of a big no-no, but this should give us a bit more intimate detail and all that nice crispity goodness, because this library, I think, is sort of more about the texture and timbre more than trying to sound like a traditional viola or string library. To record everything, I'm going to use my Tascam Porta Capture and just throw that on a table next to me. That way I can start and stop the recordings and keep an eye on the levels and all that good stuff without having to run back and forth between my computer and the mics. As well, because it can capture in 32-bit float, we'll use that to get some higher quality recordings, which should help us get a reduced noise floor. In terms of a plan of attack, I think in order to keep this instrument library lightweight and accessible for everybody, I want to get away with as few samples as possible, and you really often don't need as many samples as you might think. As long as there aren't any time-based effects like LFOs or delays or things like that, you can often get away with as little as two notes per octave. Typically, I start by sampling every tritone, and that's usually enough to get me where I need to be. And in this case, since a viola is tuned in fifths, and that's pretty close, we should be able just to sample every open and string and get away with that. Another thing I've learned in the last week or so of experimenting is that notes tend to sound best with four passes of the bow, going one, two, three, four. Then in the DAW, you take that gap between bowings, cut it out, and then crossfade the clips together, and you get one long sustained note that evolves a bit. And when you add loop points later on, it sounds a lot less loopy and a bit more authentic. For this instrument, I think we're gonna go with maybe three or four round robins and just doing each open string. This shouldn't take long to record at all and it should be a lot of fun. So let's get to it. All right, and at the risk of triggering every viola player on the planet, let's do this thing. Righto, friendos, here we are in the DAW. I've recorded out a couple different sample sets just to start experimenting with things and see where I want to take this. So if we play back just a single sample set here, I've mapped this out to just the default Bitwig sampler, and one articulation or technique on its own really doesn't sound half bad. And with a little bit of reverb, this should sound really nice. Lately, I've really been enjoying this crystalline one from Baby Audio because it has some cool time sync bass controls, which is sort of unique for a reverb and a couple different flavors. But overall, it's very CPU efficient and sounds very clean, I guess, if I could describe it, without feeling too overly sterile. So feeding that single sample set into this reverb with a relatively short time and a really low mix, we get this. And I think that sounds pretty good. So what I've done here is layer up a couple different techniques onto different samplers. So here is kind of the core sample set that we just heard. And then I've got another technique panned out to the hard right and another technique panned out to the hard left. And as you can see, if we swap between these, it's different samples. So what this means is it's almost like we have a group of three viola players playing, but they're all playing different techniques all at the same time in different positions. So putting those three together and with that little bit of reverb run on top, I 
I think that sounds really, really good. Another thing I've learned throughout this whole experiment is putting a really long delay with a mild feedback and a very low mix on top of everything is a great way to just fill things out. Not only if you have a stereo delay will this enhance the stereo image further, it gives you a sort of ensemble effect because we're repeating moments and textures and time that happened a little bit ago on top of what's currently going on, so it feels just massive in the end. So putting the delay on top now. I really love how detailed and haunting that sounds, and I think that's sort of the sonic theme. I'm going to try and play into with this library. Another idea here was taking those rhythmic plucks and mapping them onto two different samplers. So I've got one set here and another set here. So these are the different strings being plucked just sort of randomly, but I've split the four strings across two different samplers and again pan them out to the left and right. This way, because we only have one sample essentially, when we play this back because of how time stretching and sampling works, these are all going to play back at different rates and feel like it's a ton of different samples when in reality, at this moment, it's only four. So once we add some round robins, this is going to sound nuts, but this on its own sounds really, really cool. <laughs> So throwing that on top of all the other sample articulations and players in this sort of weird ensemble, we get the final result. And I think that sounds gorgeous. So with the samples I've built so far and with the idea kind of cooking, I've decided I also want to layer in some warm analogy synth stuff because the strings at the moment sound really good, I think. They just feel very cold and I don't want that full on Nordic film score vibe, at least for the whole thing. I think it would be nice to have the option to warm things up and add a bit of substance with some synth layers. So this is Dune 3. It's one of my favorite synthesizers because the sound quality of it is just a thing of beauty. But there's a new feature in one of the recent updates that is like mind-blowingly useful, and it's called genetics. So what I've done is use the genetics feature to build a sort of complementary pad sound to layer with these strings. And I want that sort of analog synth string vibe, but a bit more dark and filtered and a bit more modern. So what I've done is combine three different patches in Dune with the genetics feature and created this sound. which should layer really nicely with those strings. Anyways, back on subject here, the dune layer I created of that really dark, warm, filtered, cinematic, analog-y string patch layered with the strings that we've recorded so far. Like, damn, that sounds really cool. So at this point, I've got like a billion and one ideas. So I think what I'm going to do is finish recording the rest of the source materials. And from there, there's endless things I can do with them in the DAW with different effects and combinations and layers and whatnot. So I think it's time to finish recording and go code the decent sampler instruments and get this stuff ready to be used. All right, and through the power of a little bit of Hollywood magic, here we are a couple weeks later, and I've got the final thing done. And I think I even managed to wear a different color shirt in this clip, so I got that going for me. The final thing turned out really, really cool, and I'm pretty pleased with this.
And I think it's awesome that through the power of something as simple as sampling, I was able to take an instrument I have no idea how to play and turn it into something usable. So I think ultimately that makes this experiment a success. This instrument was sort of a challenge because I had to kind of figure it out as I was developing it, which was sort of hard. And in hindsight, I wish I would have planned things out better. But again, I think this was all about the discovery of whatever happens along the way happens. So I came up with these layered patches like I originally talked about in the Bitwig sampler where I've got the individual articulations layered on top of each other and I created a synth sub layer just to add a bit of weight and substance and then I gave a slider here so you can take that away if you don't want it. But I decided it would be cool if I would extend the whole idea here because the layer patches are neat. There's some like this that are very sort of layered. There's ones like this that make use of more of a variety of textures. And then there are some other ones that are a bit more, I guess, standard string. things, but I wanted to give a bit more control and make this a bit more usable for myself in the future. One of the unique things I figured out along the way with this was utilizing round robins to create fake ensembles of players without having to use any additional samples, which is really cool. So every note was sampled three times, and what I did was create three groups of the same three samples, but rotate the order they're in, and then pan them out center, left, and right. So that when you play, you have three players playing a single technique rather than a layered set of techniques, but you still get the benefit of that layered ensemble of players feel. And I love just how haunting and beautiful this feels. And it's really fun to think that I had no idea how to play this instrument as I was doing it, but you can create these just really gorgeous textures and moods from sort of approaching things in a bit of a weird way. So with that, I created other ensembles of single techniques. And I figured it would be useful as well if there was a soloist version of these things, because you can layer these ensembles to create the layered patches, but I figured it might be nice if there were single versions of single techniques that you could kind of add that extra oomph to things with. So on top of everything, I created soloist patches. This is just one player playing one technique with just that same set of round robin samples without it being an ensemble effect. So this is just like one player playing one thing. And this is what I use to create the layered patches. And I really love how sort of intimate the solo patches are. And I think that adds a really cool level of kind of expressive detail on top of everything else with the library. Another thing I learned along the way was that these samples sounded amazing pitched down. So I extended the key range down further than I guess I would have normally thought to do. So you have the natural range of the viola, but extending it way, way down into the low kind of sub octave region, you get these really cool, super deep and mean notes that take forever to evolve, but layering the other stuff on top of that. Just sounds really, really cool. So I'm super excited about the end result. I think this turned out awesome and it's so fun to play around with because it sounds really weird and different and not really like a whole lot of other string libraries out there that I've heard. And I think that should really be a fun thing to utilize this in my music and some client work just to have a sample set that's truly unique to me and my I guess, sort of tastes with things. So I had a lot of fun with this idea, and I think this was pretty cool, and I've learned a lot from it. 
Not only did I get to play around and explore things and learn, I guess, a bit about my own flow in my creative process, but in the end, I ended up with a really unique string library to use in my music and in client work for composing gigs and whatnot. And of course, what kind of asshole would I be if I didn't share the spoils of victory with all of you? So as usual, there's a free version of the Decent Sampler instrument down in the description you can go pick up to play around with for yourself, and there's a paid version if you want to grab that to support the channel and future videos like this one with more sounds and all the extra bits and features. I think my biggest takeaways from this whole experiment are that it's a lot more fun to be wrong than it is to be right, because in these moments you discover ideas and techniques and things you wouldn't have thought of normally that you can then apply to your usual creative processes and your work and your other sessions, and that's really valuable. But what's most interesting to me about this is that through this approach and through this method of learning, you're not approaching things with a given set of instructions or a method that you've learned from a YouTube video or a book or something like that. You exist simultaneously as the teacher and the student. And that's really interesting. It's in these moments where you find these golden nuggets of unexpected ideas that I think the most value comes out. Because it's cool to think that when you find those moments, you didn't really have to practice to achieve them. You sort of fell on it by accident. And I think you can learn a lot that way sometimes. And of course, in the end, maybe the biggest takeaway of all is that not everything needs to be magical and not everything works out, especially on the first try. And sometimes what you're working on is just a giant pile of garbage. And that's totally okay, because sometimes it's just about having fun and seeing what happens and letting things fall into place when they do along the way. So that wraps everything up for this video. This was a ton of fun. I definitely want to do this again at some point. And thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And as always, I hope this inspires you to get out there and make something awesome.